on Twitter, what I did a few days ago or last week is actually suggested, what would you rather I do? Would you rather I go through lots and lots and lots of ideas, or would you rather I spend my time talking about one or two in a bit of depth? Of course, there was a mixed opinion. So what I'm going to do is spend 20 minutes talking about one key idea, uh, and then another 25 minutes getting through as many of the remainder as I possibly can. Uh, what I always recommend, is it gone off again? What I always recommend <laughs> is that uh, if you see one of these ideas and clearly the topic is not relevant to you, just try and think about how you could transfer it to another topic of your choice. So first of all, the, the one I want to share with you all is escape rooms, which I've been experimenting with for the past 18 months or so. I've done about 10 of these for different topics now, and I've kind of fine-tuned them. The problem with them at first was that they were great fun, uh, but the students might walk out of the lesson at the end of it having had a great time, but not necessarily having learned as much as they would have done. So the challenge was, can I come up with a format which means that they have an incredibly great time, have really good fun in the escape room scenario, which I'll explain in a moment, and at the end of it, they've got a great deal of knowledge from it. And secondly, can they easily replicate these next time? So can I come up with a format where other teachers can easily come up with their own escape room formats? Just in case you're not familiar, the scenario is you're locked in a room for whatever reason. I'll give you a scenario in a moment. And the students have to escape in a space of 45 minutes to an hour by solving a series of puzzles. If you've ever done one in a team building exercise or similar, um, you'll know there's all sorts of logic puzzles and so on, which you can work in, but the point here is that I want to give you a format where you can design your own escape room for your own students very, very simply with a minimum of fuss and then easily replicate those for the year groups and topics. Are we still all right at the back? Brilliant. So you need five things. Incidentally, this PowerPoint presentation and the others uh, that I'll be showing you, I will be uploading and sharing with you later. So you don't necessarily need to be taking lots of notes or taking photographs, and I will hyperlink. Gone again, and I will hyperlink um, all of the different resources so that you can just uh, go to them on the web directly and download the resources. So for the escape room, you need five things. Is this still working? I don't know what yeah. it is. Yeah, it just sounds like it isn't. Okay. Number one, you have a scenario. Why are they locked in the room? Why is your class locked in the room? Number two. A series of sources sprinkled around the room. Whatever you've got, pictures, primary sources, textbooks, books off your own shelf. Number three, a series of mission slips, which are simply questions based on the sources. Questions that they will answer from the sources. And then a timeline. That's all you need. A timeline of 10 key events, 10 key questions, and the questions can be answered from some sources. That's all you actually need to get it going. So as they come into the room, the students have a chance to look around the different sources which are in there. So I'll just give you an example of that. I think this is a little video clip. Sound isn't coming through that, never mind. I've actually got some uh, Cuban missile, uh, some Cuban music playing here. This is a Cuban theme one. Doesn't really matter, the sound isn't so important. So you see, it's just loads of sources around the room and lots of random objects as well, like a World War I shell. They're just red herrings, they mean nothing. The globe. But it's just the chair on the desk. There's just, and that is actually, well, they think it's cocaine on the floor. <laughs> they get quite excited. It's actually sugar. And there's a, qu a quiz question. One of the missions is this is the main cash crop for Cuba, and it's on the mirror. What is it? And they answer it wrong. They actually lose some valuable time. So they have a chance to look at the sources for one minute as they come in. Let's have a look then at. Those five things very briefly. I'm going to give you a sample scenario, see how simple that is. Sample sources, sample timeline, sample questions. And then you can see how they all join up. So this one is Mission Galileo. There'll be a series of images here which show you how I've done with different year groups. I've done them all the way from year seven all the way through to the top of A level. And they always really enjoy them. They're very, very easy to put together. So you can see in this one, for example, lots of images of Renaissance type things and books relating to Francis the First, as well as the inevitable World War I shell, which always makes an appearance. <laughs> so here is one which I, the mo most recent one I did was two weeks ago with uh, Year 9. It's 1888, you're an amateur detective studying the infamous Jack the Ripper murders. In the autumn of that year, the police arrest you after spotting you at all of the crime scenes. 
You've been brought here to the main investigation room for interrogation. The police have locked you inside after being called out on urgent business. That explains why the sources are all around the room. You're in the interrogation room. You've got 45 minutes to escape, people. You've got to get hold of the spare key, which is locked in a box in the centre of our classroom that you'll see, before the police return and charge you with the murders. And then this is where you get to how it operates in class. What the class has to do is firstly locate the mission slips. In other words, the 10 questions. Right, so you should call them mission slips, but it's very simple. You're just looking at 10 questions that you've written on pieces of paper and hidden around the room. Um, some might be on the ceiling, for example. That's one of my favorite ones. You might put them on, one of my favorites the other week, put them on one of these blinds if you have them in your room and then wind the blind up. Yes, like that. Put one underneath the table. And then halfway through the lesson say, well, to find one of the mission slips, you'll have to look upwards. Then they're all staring at the ceiling, of course, they found that one touching under the table. So you put them wherever you want in the room, but they're just ten questions, as simple as that. As soon as anyone finds one of those mission slips, one of the questions, they wave it in the air like Willy Wonka's golden ticket and freeze the class. And then they read out the mission. They read out the question. I'll show you some examples in a moment. The class has to decide. Who will now try to solve that question, answer that question, solve the mission, and who's going to carry on looking for the remaining slips? If anyone then thinks they have answered that question, they find an answer from the sources around the room, the class is frozen again. They read out their answer. Now if it's correct, at that point, everybody takes notes. This is the really important bit, incidentally. Everybody takes notes. They've got clipboards as they come in. This is something I learned after doing the first couple where they do the exercise itself, but walk out of the room with no notes. They come back and the knowledge is gone. So what you do is you say to them, right, all of you write down the question. All of you write down this answer. It is correct. And then you read out the first piece of your timeline. Remember, 10 questions, 10 pieces of the timeline. They jot that down. You impress upon them that the final mission of locking that box will require them to demonstrate their knowledge of the timeline and the questions they are answering throughout the process. More on that in a moment. But this was a really big improvement, I thought, last time. Now, once they have completed all of the missions, they've answered 10 questions after finding 10 slips, and therefore they've got 10 questions, answers, and 10 pieces of the timeline. All of them have made notes there. They will have a final task to complete to open the box. That will be coming up shortly. But it is very important that you impress on the students that every single one of them needs to take notes. No passengers. You'll find if you've done these before that sometimes certain students will wander around after 10 minutes they're not doing very much and chatting to their friends. So here are some sample sources. This one here is the, the Whitechapel one I just outlined. So you can see the sort of things we mean. Nothing difficult to get hold of, just images you found on the web. If you're not familiar with uh, this book, incidentally, the five untold stories of the uh, women killed by Jack the Ripper, which was recently published, is absolutely superb. It's really focusing very heavily just on the social conditions and the lives of those women and the conditions they experience rather than on the murders themselves. Which is what I do as well, I'm sure you do too. It's more about, it's not about the gory murders of course. But you put these all around the room, spread around. Some of them will be needed to answer the questions. Some of them are there just for further interest and in acting as red herrings. When you get into them, you'll start actually writing some of these missions in the form of uh, Mexican code wheels and obscuring them and so on. If you get into it, you have a bit of fun, but that's a rather different approach. So this is the sort of thing I mean. I call them mission sloops, but they're just factual questions. I just highlighted up three so you can get an idea of the sorts of ways in which you could use them. Mission fingerprint. I'll give each one a little title that has something to do with the topic too, and they can research these words for extension. In Horace Warner's book of Victorian children, identify the page on which little Tommy Nail makes an appearance and find out from the index when he later died. So just testing index skills there, really. Mission Jekyll, one of the greatest true crime mysteries of the Victorian era was the railway murder of Thomas Briggs. What was the name of the man, I should say, not me, eventually executed for the murder? That's from Mr. Briggs's hat. It's just a book I've got on the shelf, but it's from the same period. And then finally, Here's another example. According to the Dear Boss letter written by Jack the Ripper to the police, what did he put into a ginger beer bottle, like this one? The mission is actually inside the ginger beer bottle. And why did his plans for it go wrong? 
And there you see some of the students engaged in the process where they found that mission ripper, the one I just read out. And then Abby here, one of my students currently, she found the Dear Boss letter and she's reading it out to the class. And you can see that some of them got their clipboards there taking notes. Other people in the class are at the other side of the room still hunting for the remaining slips and answers to other questions. That one there is based on you are locked in a prison cell by the Nazis directly after their takeover of power. You're social democrats and you've been accused of the Reichstag fire. You need to escape from that. It's all about Hitler's consolidation of power. So there is your sample timeline. So you've got 10 questions, 10 mission slips, the sources to answer them. And each time they successfully answer a question, you read out to them a different piece of the timeline. Always in order. So they slowly build up the chronology of or well, the key chronology for the topic in question. And then once they've answered all 10, you can say, congratulations, you've got there, you've done it. You're almost there. You can now unlock the box. You have everything you need. You can do this however you want. But I basically say you're going to answer four factual questions now based on the timeline to test your knowledge. And if you do so, you escape. In one class, I take my World War I shell, probably my best ever prop, and I simply said that if you answer the four questions, you can pull it apart, and then when they do so, they defuse the bomb, they can escape, they're saved, and when they pour out the actual casing, it's full of sweets, and the class all goes crazy, and they have loads there, so it can be nice and easy. This one, though, I found much more fun, probably in a sadistic way, but you've got four padlocks here, and each padlock is set to a key date in the timeline. They have any remaining time that's still on the clock to get out of the room by getting the key out of that box. Now at this point, I say, right, question one. I've highlighted these to myself. Remember, this is a, just one sheet. You don't have to print this out to give to the students. You read it out to them so they take notes. So I'll say, right, Josh. Or oh, where's Paul? Paul! There he is. Paul was at my course yesterday and he's decided to turn up again today. I said, have a lie in, Paul. I'm not going to tell you stuff you know already, but he's coming there just to heckle, I think. But I'm going to say, Paul, I've noticed in this exercise that you've not been doing anything for the past 45 minutes. You've been chatting to your two mates. So I'm going to ask you this question, Paul. And then I read out, what was the date at which Sir Robert Peel set up the Metropolitan Police Force in London? The rest of the class have to stay absolutely silent. And he has to come up to the front and hopefully unlock one of the padlocks by knowing the date. He has 60 seconds maximum to do so. If he's not been paying attention, not doing his notes, he can't unlock the box and he's getting death stares from the rest of the class and retires in disgrace. At that point, I then point at somebody else and say, you, you get up to the front. And I might give them the same question. I might give them one of the remaining ones. They have 60 seconds and everybody else has to sit there in excruciating pain watching the seconds tick by. Hopefully, they will get out, but maybe they won't. So in that way, you then get them to act together, they work as a team, they are taking detailed notes, and then in the subsequent lesson that follows, I then test their knowledge. This gives me an opportunity to show my favourite quiz format at the moment that I've developed, which is, how certain are you? I don't know if you've tried this. Anyone tried this one out yet? I like it when no one puts up hands, that's good. If everyone does, I'm not giving you anything fresh. You might want to try this one out. You can uh, download this from my blog. And all you basically have is a standard factual test. But on the right-hand side, the students have to nominate how many points they are playing for. If they play for one point, they only get one point. But if they play for three, they'll get three points. But if they get it wrong, they lose the same amount of points. So you're testing the depth of their knowledge, maybe, how confident they are, how secure they are in their knowledge. It kind of uh, dissuades them from guessing any of the answers too, which might be quite helpful. So you can download that template and use it. My students sort of have a love-hate relationship with these quizzes. When I say, right, factual test, and it's, how certain are you? They sort of groan in dismay. But they, I think they like it, really. Now, secondly, I'm doing well, great. I've got time. Unlock the box. This is going to be five minutes, and then I'm going to have 25 minutes, just as many things as I can get through. The unlocking the box element of the escape room is something which I find quite good fun, and I thought, can I actually adapt this just to be a rolling programme? So what I do, not necessarily every week, that would be a bit much, but you get the box out of the room with the hasp on it and four locks. 
And then what you do is you lock inside the box some information about the individual in question or the event in question. And each day you put a different sticker on the box, giving them a further clue about what the combination is to unlock the box. Just wondering if this is a video. It might well be. Have we got the sound? Yeah, the sound isn't great. Right, so I'm just showing them all opening the box. If you can't hear, there were several clues which then led them to a particular date. Yes. And then when they open it up, they have a sheet of information about the event or individual in question, which they had to read. And then they had to leave the room for a couple of three minutes and come back to me once they have the answers or think they know the information. I'll ask them a series of questions about that sheet of information. So just to elaborate, you put the box outside your room. On day one, you give them one clue about the event or individual that's inside the box, or referred to inside the box. Each subsequent day, you put a fresh clue. And then each break time, they have a chance to try to unlock the box, anyone that's interested. All of these students here are a bit gutted. It was all the way from year seven through to year 11, I think we're playing it on that particular occasion. So for example, on Monday morning, they see outside my room that the box has that clue on it. I was a famous graduate of Cambridge University. Now, they've got a lock that's got a date on it, so they probably guess that it's the birth date or the death date of that particular individual. So they might have a little bit of a go. The next day, Tuesday morning, I was an important figure in the British Navy. They start talking, is it Admiral Nelson? I might hover over them and say, well, you're in, you know, year 10. Maybe it's the guy who invented the dreadnought. And they'll just, well, I'll just wander off at that point. They start talking, who was that? Oh, Jackie Fisher. Jackie, when was he born? When did he they start trying that, start researching on their phones and on the web. I was interested in secret codes. And I think they know who it is yet. Yeah. Of course, you make them progressively easier. I was a personal friend of Sir Isaac Newton. That kind of takes certain people out of the equation. And then the final clue, in, on, in homage to Ian Dawson, the date on the lock tells you when I buried something strange in my garden. Who knows who it is? Samuel it's Samuel Pepys, because he buried his parmesan in his back garden because it was so valuable. And they just got that. That's who they got there when they opened the box. There was a sheet of information about Samuel Pepys. I said, congratulations. In three minutes' time, come back. You will answer five questions based on the information of Samuel Pepys. And if you successfully answer those, only then can you have the prize, which is a bag of sweets. Alternatively, you can have, as before, four date locks for different events or individuals. And each day, again, you have a different clue as follows. Here's some examples of those. That one there. First, year Mr. Tarr's favourite suffragette died. Now, they've got to find out who that individual is. They're going to type in famous suffragettes, for example, into Google Images. So they can't just Google an answer straightforwardly. And underneath, there are two factual questions. What is her name, and what were the names of her equally famous mother and sister? So if they do think they unlock the padlock box with four questions ultimately that appear, they will still have to answer those questions to claim their prize. It's not just enough to get a date and unlock the box. So it's encouraging a bit of out-of-class learning, a bit of uh, fresh learning perhaps. I'll end this presentation, this bit of it, with a, a clip of the students here, some of the younger students desperately trying to unlock the box for that one. You get an idea of how excited they get. Saying the volume isn't up, but she's saying, I know what it is, I know what it is. So you give each set of people, if there's two or three of them trying to unlock, you give them 60 seconds to unlock the box. If they fail to unlock the box, the next people in the queue can have a go at break time instead. I could carry on, but what they then do is at the end, what Selena then said is, the lock's broken. That's the common thing. <laughs> now, the lock is broken. She just looks at, she looks at the camera after two minutes and says, Mr. Tar, that lock is broken. And it isn't, she was just wrong. <laughs> okay, that was um, escape rooms there. And as I say, I'll be uploading that presentation so that you can all access it, follow the links. There's actually a sample one on my website that you can download in full and then adapt to your own purposes as well. Um, secondly then, 
I then ask people, what do you want me to do if I've talked about one thing in depth? There's as many things as you can get through. Give us a blizzard of ideas was uh, the thing. So that's what I'm going to try to do now in the remaining 25 minutes, getting through as many ideas as possible. So here we go. Right. 25 slides in 25 and a half minutes is the objective. We'll see if we manage. I've actually got some others in reserve in case I'm even quicker than that. Right, first of all, I, I was at a conference in Cologne, which I organised uh, a few months ago, which a number of the Teach Me crew were at as well, so it was a really nice chance to catch up. And one of the presenters, I don't do a presentation myself because I'm the organiser, but I pop into every single session and take a photo of every single one of the 100 sessions taking place over the two days. And I, I go in and I go out. But this one had me lingering a little bit, it intrigued me. Uh, has anyone used these before? Lotus diagrams, brilliant. Oh, single hand. I haven't seen them before either. The lady's from Australia, uh, Shani Hartley, and she said this is a great way of getting students to plan their notes. I, I'm very big on getting students to choose their own note-taking strategy. Um, so if they want to take Cornell notes, or if they're interested in sketch noting, or whatever suits them, that's fine. As long as ultimately when I test their knowledge through their essay or factual tests, etc., I can see that that's been effective. But this is another one to throw in the mix that they might like and try to um, find useful. So you have an essay question. This is the main origins of the Cold War type essay. Um, this is Paul at the beginning of his IB course. Um, what I personally do is I start by saying to the students at the start of IBA level, I will usually tell you in advance of a timed essay what the title will be. And I will also allow you at first to bring in your notes as well, a one sheet of notes. In subsequent lessons, as time goes by, I'll say, well, you can't bring in any notes anymore, but I will tell you in advance what the question is going to be. And then, of course, as time goes by a bit further, they have nothing. The stabilizers are off the bike. You won't know what the question is, and you can't have any notes. But this is a very early one. So I said to all of the class, if you want to fill in one sheet on A3 of Lotus Notes as your plan, then you can. In each of the quadrants here, we have one of the main factors, and simply the title of it. You have the key question, your four main factors, your four main paragraphs, perhaps. And then you have further space here to put in bullet points or a sentence of information, a topic sentence that will hopefully spark your memory about what you want to say and space for an associated image. And then they bring that in, you can see Paul's there, what it looks like, and then they can write their essay. But it's quite a nice essay framework. From experience, if I simply say to students, you can just bring in your notes, you'll then get some of them just writing in minuscule format and then just copying the whole essay out, they've just written the whole essay. This sort of limits that to a degree at least. We talked about how certain are you, so I've saved a minute. Uh, the Active History Podcast database, which I've got open on a tab um, on, the, on the web, but I won't bring it down, so it'll save, take a bit of time. But if you go to the Active History Podcast database, there's about 9,000 podcasts uh, on that now. It's automated, so I don't manually upload them. What I've done is I've gone through various podcast feeds, like In Our Time, Witness, Scott All Stops Ones, obviously whitelisted Scott, you of course. <laughs> But if they're not directly history related, they look for keywords. The, the code looks for keywords uh, relating to key topics in history or, or references to history. And then it will pull it in and put it in this database, which is automatically searchable. In fact, I am tempted just to show you that now. Watch this. Have a think about what I need to search for. So let's bring it on the screen. Let's see if it works. And I use this for personal research projects, internal assessments. I think they're called EPQs, I was told yesterday at A-level. There is the podcast database. What shall I search for? Karen. I identified Karen on Twitter. I was very pleased with myself. I just put a, a name to the face. What shall I search for, Karen? In my podcast database, give me something. Uh, Renaissance medicine. Ren Ren that's specific, isn't it? <laughs> All right. I'll try. Renaissance. You can see we've got 81 to do with that. Medicine. We've got there five uh, that popped up straight away. So each time, you're, each time I'm personally starting a new topic of research, I'm currently doing Mao's China for the first time. First thing I do, Mao, into the podcast database. Download all those. You click on any one of those, download it straight away to your computer, and then you can use it for your own research and for extension material for students. Um, so that's on the Active History website, freely accessible and permanently being updated. Whilst I'm on there, let's get through a couple of these. I don't know if you've seen this quiz before, but this is a new template on Class Tools, my other website. Uh, but Leslie Ann McDermott, one of the history teachers. Is Leslie Ann here today? No, it's a shame. 
But Leslie Ann got in touch with me and said, can you do one of these quizzes? Can you make a template that allows me to create them as starter activities? Anyone use this yet? Brilliant, good. Okay, 44 seconds. Listen to the uh, video extract here. I will speak over it in case the sound isn't working, but if you want to, yeah. The basic premise is you're given a series of words which slowly reveal themselves as the alphabet works backwards from Z through to A. And the team that identifies what the three words are, first of all, will get one point. If any team can then subsequently say what all those terms have got in common, I'll give them two points. And if any team can then say which of those terms is the odd one out, I'll give them three points. And then it's just a way to start. Sometimes I'll have a leaderboard building up over a little time. Hey, don't worry about the sound mic if it's not working. It's, it's okay. So it, it comes from um, House of Games, apparently. So that's what I was told. So here we go. Z to A. And this round you'll see three clues which will reveal letter by letter from Z backwards to A. You have to work out what the clues are and simply buzz in when you can tell us what connects them, please. One point for each answer. Here are your first three. What connects these three words? Fingers on buzzers, please. We have to go if you want. Shout out if you know. Yeah, okay. That is Clara and Spoke. Tea! Yeah. Are they tea? Let's put in the rest of them. Yeah. Brilliant. Well played. Canine is going to be It sounded so complicated. It's, it's, out. it's actually kind of simple, right? Yeah. Uh, very simple in the actual quiz show, but in terms of the class, I say I do it in three rounds, which I explain here. Uh, where if you do that bit, you identify and get a point. But then, can you spot the odd one out? Can you spot something they've all got in common? Just develop their knowledge a bit more, or their understanding, or their thought processes. And all you have to do is type in the terms into that box and press go, and it creates it for you in a flash of a second. So here's an example. Have a watch now. You can create several lines as well, so there's several rounds. But here's one. Just make a mental note if you want, or even shout out if you think you've identified him, what all three are. And I've got it, yeah, pop your hand up if you spotted it. Okay. Okay, by that stage, there will have been a team that's put their hand on the buzzer and they've said, they've said it's those three individuals. Congratulations, right, can you or any other team buzz again if you can tell me something they've all got in common? Round two. Right, which one is the odd one out and why? You get some quite interesting discussions on that. Suggested answer, I just put suggested odd one out is Stalin is the only one who didn't speak English as a first language. <laughs> Which you might think is, you don't say, well, I want a historically significant fact. So you say, you know, Stalin's the only one with a moustache. Say, so, well, is that relevant? Is that important to know? I think uh, the fact that Stalin was the only one who didn't speak English as a, as, at all, in fact, uh, is relevant. You know, it's often regarded as a very important kind of diplomatic piece on the chessboard, isn't it? So if they make a significant point, then they're good to go. That's that one. Here's some others. Let's go back to the PowerPoint for a minute. As you can see, I've got lots of others up here as well, which I've been coding. But let's go back to this from current slide. There we go. 18 minutes. Uh, this one, a lot of people have seen. I think this photo is actually from Karen on Twitter. Uh, but you, you may know this, but if you don't, sometimes people haven't seen it. And I think that people, more people know than they do. Uh, but I used to have a word wall where I used to write all over my glass windows in my classroom. It's always a talking point. Every time we found a really interesting historical word or piece of terminology that's useful for essay writing, we put it there. But eventually I was told that that was not allowed anymore. The windows needed to be clean in our schools, they're for looking out of, not for writing on, etc., etc. So instead, I produced one of these uh, bookmarks, which uh, has turned out to be very popular. And lots of people have, have used these and made their own versions of them, turned them into table mats. So what I do is I print off an entire set and give them to students to use. So that if their essay writing is looking a little bit stale, I can give them a few tips on that. My clicker. Um, this one is Active History KUK New History, and what this one automatically does is goes to various newspaper websites all over the country and pulls in, or like the world, sorry, and pulls in any relevant headlines that seem to have something related to history. I have a quick little glance at those, 
Um, notable anniversaries are highlighted as well that you can't talk about in class. And then a thing I like to do that you might not be familiar with is put up a bit of news outside your classroom. History in the news each week on a Monday morning before registration. Uh, this is a regular thing. See what the most interesting debatable question is. In this instance here, there was a, a teacher who had been suspended for a lesson showing remarkable parallels between the rise of Trump and Hitler. So I give them the story and then frame it as a question. Should he have been suspended? Yes or no? And at the beginning of appropriate lessons, sometimes they are age appropriate, but I'll read it out to the relevant classes and say, what do you think? Yes or no? Let's talk that through. What are, the, what are the pros? What are the cons? The rights and wrongs of that. We debate them through. It can be quite interesting. They then put their names into the sheets, and over the course of the week it builds up with names of teachers who may have expressed an opinion as well. And then we have a vote at the end. And what you see here is the corridor where week by week by week they sort of build up down the corridors. These issues are permanently being refresh that people are thinking about the relevance of history in the current affairs arena. What you can also download from the website Active History is this free calendar which I produce every August, so it runs from September to August, and I've highlighted off some key events each uh, month, which I think could be of interest for cleaneries, starters, assemblies, personal research projects and so on. Up in the corner, for example, there, it sells in, 69, in March 1969, 50 years ago on that date, uh, the first flight of Concorde was tested from Toulouse, which is where I'm from, so it's a personal one. Uh, but most of them, of course, are all to do with all sorts of world events. You can download that and print it off, put it in your classroom. Breaking news generator, one of my students for revision, I, I said, right, you need to produce a timeline, a chronology, your, your concept of dates and of ordering is all over the place, you're getting everything mixed up, everything, you know, you've got a hyperinflation in 1929, you know, the classic, those sorts of things. So he produced a timeline of key events as images with captions, which I think the fancy word meant is dual coding. <laughs> <laughs> Words plus images, dual coding. I'm very au fait with these things. But you can just put in an event, upload an image, and create one of those. He found that very useful for revision. This is an idea from uh, the maths crowd. So the math chat crew are big on this one here, which is using rice to represent different statistics. Think carefully about this. You'll find a blog post on my TARS Toolbox blog, which I'll give you a link to as well, of course. And I give you a variety of ideas about things you might be able to turn into rice statistics. It also tells you what weight of rice um, is represented by, well, say that again, how many grains of rice are in a particular weight of rice or a particular size person. It could be people obviously who died in particular battles or wars compared and contrasted, but maybe people who were on particular marches, like the Salt March compared to the Selma March compared to whatever else. You could also have a mix of maybe brown and white rice to represent two different types of people or individuals or themes, depending on what you're doing there. So it's quite a flexible approach. This one here, after I shared that blog post, there were a couple of people who then shared these on the IB History Teachers Group, which I'm a member of. And this one here represents 20% of the land, uh, sorry, 20% of the population of 80% of the land in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, whereas 80% of the, the black population, of course, were just given that. So it's trying to highlight that point there. This one here shows escalation of US presence in Vietnam year by year. So you can think about various ways you could go about that. There is a video about that here, which I might play just a minute of now, if it works. <laughs> These are the people who originally came up with the idea in London. Of all the people in all the world is an exhibition in which we use grains of rice to represent human statistics. We have two tons of rice, which is 120 million grains. And from that stock of rice, we make smaller piles of rice to show those human statistics and develop narratives in the comparison between them. In the Inner Temple there are lots of portraits and uh, references to the Great Fire. Behind me there's a portrait of King James II, who wasn't the king at the time, but was uh, the king's brother. He was very active in fighting the fire. Other portraits in the room are of the fire judges who were involved in working out who owned the land and where the boundaries were in that ownership when the city was rebuilt. In looking into uh, ideas for the show, we found the statistic of all the people that were made homeless by the Great Fire, and that got us thinking about 
principally parallels. So in, in this version of the show, we have a pile of rice that represents all the refugees in the world today. The power of this show uh, in changing the world is giving the basis of where do we go from here, how can the world change, what needs to change, what doesn't need to change, where are we good at being in this world and where are we bad at being in this world. Okay, so I want to think about how you could do that. We had that as an exhibition all the way down our corridor where different subject groups, uh, you know, science, maths, arts, sorry, um, just were, had to choose for themselves how could we represent some of the key statistics in our subject uh, through RICE. This is another one from the maths crew, which one doesn't belong, a W-O-T-B on uh, Twitter is the hashtag, and they often share ideas about different mathematical shapes and symbols and equations and so on. Uh, you can easily use it for history as well, I use it as a starter activity sometimes. They just put four images up, just picking up on the Z to H, another way of doing it. Which one is the odd one out? You can play it over several rounds, I can keep on adding ideas more and more and more. So we started earlier by talking about the fact that Stalin's the only one with a moustache. No points, that's not relevant, that's not significant, you don't need to know it. You focus instead on the fact that Stalin couldn't speak English, that Stalin was the only one who attended both the Ultra and Potsdam from start to finish, etc, etc. This is what I tried out last week, and I really think this has got a lot of potential, so I'm quite keen to share this one with you. Ten minutes left, didn't I? And what I've got here is an essay I have written with the students. Each time my students write uh, an essay in tight conditions, I always write it with them. Uh, you may do the same. So that afterwards I can give them a model essay and we can talk more specifically about the strengths and weaknesses of their piece. I used to write a history review quite regularly. It was a great way for me keeping my skills on top. And unfortunately, the magazine has been kind of like folded by history today in the past few years. And I thought, well, it's a shame. I've got this essay. I reckon that could have been a good article on Nixon's domestic policies. I was pressed for time. I am pressed for time. So this was last week. And my students have still got a fair bit of content to get through before study leave. So I gave them a bit of a lecture on Nixon's domestic policies. We did a bit of the pros and cons of what the main themes were. And I said, you're going to have a factual test next week on Nixon. You'll probably only need him to compare with Johnson, if, if at all. So we don't spend too much time on it. Your challenge, I said to them, is to turn my essay into an article. So what does make a good article? What are you going to have to do? If you're a layout editor, if you're a publisher, what would you need to do to take that raw material and turn it into something a bit better? And we talked about the fact that after looking at some issues of history today and so on, you'd have to have a title that sort of makes a mini thesis statement all, almost. It kind of really just makes a central point. What is the agenda of this writer? You also have a thesis statement here. Russell Tarr argues that despite harsh rhetoric at the time of the economic crisis, Nixon was both liberal and successful in his domestic policies. So for revision purposes, you've got the essence of what the argument is. Key quotes or memorable sound bites you can put in here. Subheadings, of course, to break it down a bit, working out what the structure of the piece is. A timeline of key events in a separate box. Further reading at the end. And we spent about five or ten minutes going through articles, spotting the sorts of things that publishers and editors do with the raw data to turn it into something more accessible. And I thought that'd be a nice way of getting them to read an essay in an active manner. I used these last week as well uh, to great effect. We're doing the civil rights movement at the moment. And what I like to do is to, at the beginning of the unit, give them a series of character cards relating to the people in question, or some of the key individuals that represent different social groups and experiences. They're all true stories, and I provide the students with the information on the left, and then challenge them, what do you think is going to happen next? They reflect on it, they talk about it with a partner, they compare their scenarios, and then of course I reveal what happened. I'm going to read this one out, just give you a second to think about it before showing you, and then I'll tell you what I do with them afterwards. So it says here, you are the Reverend Martin Luther King, father of MLK Jr. of course. You are out shopping for shoes with your 10 year old son. You have just sat down in the first empty seat at the front of the store. A young white clerk comes up and murmurs politely, I'll be happy to wait on you if you'll just move to those seats in the rear. How do you react? Or more specifically, yeah, how do you, the father, react? I was thinking, what do you think is going to happen next? They've got a bit of basis in what the civil rights movement was about and the Jim Crow laws, but that's all. I also then point out that clearly this stuck in the young Martin Luther King Jr.'s mind, because he later must have wrote, written about it, and that's why we know. 
It also raises questions about whether we can actually trust what he says, but that's another thing. How do you react? What do you expect is going to happen? That could be a number of things. What did happen is that Dad immediately retorted, there's nothing wrong with these seats, we're quite comfortable here. Sorry, said the clerk, you'll have to move. We'll either buy shoes sitting here, my dad said, or we won't buy shoes at all. Whereupon he took me by the hand, we walked out of the store. This was the first time I had seen Dad so furious. That experience revealed to me at a very early age that my father had not adjusted to the system, and he played a great part in shaping my conscience. I still remember walking down the street beside him as he muttered, I don't care how long I have to live with the system, I will never accept it. And that can have a discussion based on that, about how it's affecting people, um, causes for it, what's likely to change, and so on. There's a whole series of them, and then I give the students other names and say, now produce your own character cards by researching another key individual. Now, the way in which you can adapt this, even if you don't do the civil rights movement, is let's say you're looking at Nazi Germany, you want to look at how Nazi Germany affected the people, or how successfully Hitler achieved his policies, or whatever. Choose a series of real individuals, maybe use the book like Travellers in the Third Reich, and then try and identify different individuals that represent different groups. Maybe one of the characters represents the female experience, one represents youth, one represents business, one represents the farmers, and so on. And then try and find out a key moment in their experience of Nazi Germany to turn into a character card. And then you've got some ready-made data there that students can deploy in exam answers about real individuals in real situations rather than just abstracted textbook points and findings. Silent discussion. Who's familiar with the silent discussion method? Surely there's quite a few of you there. Excellent, okay. Just give you a specific example then. Vietnam War protest songs. Did this a couple of weeks ago with my um, upper sixth. They really enjoyed it. Put the Vietnam War songs, protest songs. The big question is, what do the protest songs reveal about the motives and concerns about the people who were against the war? They annotate them in the way where they're rotating around the room. Most of you seem familiar with the approach. And then what I asked them to do at the end, which was quite good fun, is to nominate one song that they were intrigued to hear. So they had to stand next to one of those sets of lyrics, the one which clearly has the most in it, which is the most historically useful. Anticipate what style of music it's going to be. Is it going to be rock? Is it going to be blues? Is it going to be folk, for example? And then they look it up and they would play each one of those on the screen and talk it through a bit more. But they found that a really interesting approach to the, the social protest movement. Crime boards, if you're going to start connecting factors together, one uh, method I've experimented with is the use of crime boards to connect the different factors. So most recently, we've had, we do an Earthsea, the Iceman mystery project. Uh, me and Matt Podry sometimes did it himself this year, their timetables weren't aligned. Uh, but at the end, when they're trying to come up with answers, they could do it as a flow chart, they could do it as a written piece, but they could connect factors as crime boards. Here's an example of the attempted assassination of Verbord. Who assassinated Verbord? And I use this as a, a way of getting students into all the different protest groups relating to South Africa. So they had to identify what the different groupings were, how they were connected, how they overlapped, if they were violent, non-violent, and so on. Were they likely to be the culprits? And then joined all their thinking together in what's pretty much an opening section on that topic. But any topic where you can identify a key event and then who is responsible for it, or anything which has a series of factors that you wish to connect, you could use a crime board format. Alternatively, I quite like the idea of decision trees. You know, in like magazines where it's kind of like answer yes or no to this question, it slowly guides you to the perfect spot. I don't even know which Roman emperor are you? you know, do you like slaughtering Christians in your spare time? It's not questions like that. You have open ended questions where you could go either way. And this one here is which of the anti apartheid resistance movements would you have belonged to? So imagine you're donating money to one of them from London, and there was an anti-apartheid organisation in London of course, and a question might be asked, do you want to put your money into an organisation which is limited to blacks only members, so it's maintaining the focus and they're not creating the impression of relying upon white people, or do you think it should be multiracial? And you always frame the question in such a way where you can see the benefits of both. And they go yes, no. So the students have all the information about the different groups to start with, and their challenge is first to come up with a question which divides them into two broad categories and then proceed doing that again and again until they get narrowed down. But it really makes them look at the comparisons, contrasts, overlaps. DVD template, let's skip two there. I sometimes get students in their personal research projects to do uh, an imagined DVD documentary. 
I've got a template on class tools that you can download, and it's just a Word document. You just change the images and the text within it, um, so you can create your own documentary. Or it's the blurb at the back. I use that with younger students, especially. Two minutes. Design your own mark scheme. Anyone tried these yet? Design your own homework. Open homework tasks are things which are quite popular now. Just giving students the chance to choose their own homework outcome. Uh, but what me and Matt in geography have been doing is we've taken the IB learner profile, some of these kind of honourable qualities which we hope to nurture in our students, being inquisitive, formal, communicative, knowledgeable and so on. And we say to the students, with your open homework project, I want you to tell me which of the three of the IB learner profile attributes you think you've demonstrated. And explain to me why you think it should be marked high for those qualities. So in this one, you see on the left here, they want their project to be marked to be creative, resilient, and a risk taker. And in resilient was quite funny. I was resilient because Pinto, my rabbit, destroyed my module and I had to start it all over again. <laughs> but underneath, I was a risk taker because doing a 3D model of my project wasn't something I'd done before. So sometimes the project comes in, well, that's very nice, but you don't actually appreciate the fact that they've obviously put a lot of work into that. That was something very new for them and that allows them to highlight it. And then I give a mark out of 10 based on how far the project meets the qualities which they have identified as far as they are concerned. In subsequent projects, you simply tell them they must choose a different set of criteria. So they'll do the same ones all the time. I have about 30 seconds. You all, do you all know who tall are you? Raise your hand if you don't know who tall are you. A few people don't. Again, download it. It's great fun. You put it up on your wall and then students and staff measure themselves against it to see what famous historical characters share the same height. Stick an essay into Word Law Taxino to decide if it actually matches and identifies the key terms. Reverse that process. Bring the Word up and say, right, what essay do you think that was? What was the title for that essay? If you're a bit bored of Venn diagrams, I've produced a template for hexagon Venn diagrams. TripAdvisor graphics, if you look at anything which is um, location based, then get them to kind of do ratings of the League of Nations of the 1920s that way, for example. And that's it, I've done it! That's our A.K.P. Taylor movie time, right? On the nail! Well, thank you very much, and if you have any questions about any of that, please uh, do come to see me during the course of the day. Feel free to contact me on Twitter, and I'll be sharing the presentations with all the links to all of those resources and more so you can use them in your own classrooms. Thank you very much.